Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's PMI Friday webinar, What Makes a Good Greenbelt Project? And this uh, webinar is being presented today by Sean Buckland, and it's a first for Sean. Um, he recently joined us, and we're looking forward to today and your first venture on a webinar, Sean. My name is Susanna Clark. I'm going to be facilitating the session today, and that includes running the Q&A desk. So for those of you who are familiar with our webinars and have joined us before, you know that the Q&A button and the chat buttons can be found on the Zoom control panel. So please do keep your questions coming. We love to hear what you've got to say, and we're really keen to keep you involved. So also any comments, any observations, and I will put them to Sean. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will send you a link via email to the recording at the beginning of next week. And that will have both the presentation you're going to see today and also the audio. As usual, we are broadcasting live on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So to those of you who are joining us on those live streams, we welcome you. In future, if you want to participate in any of our polls and receive a recording via email of the webinar, then please do register for the uh, webinar on pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. We'll be sending all registered participants a short voice to the customer survey at the end of the session today. And we're really grateful for your feedback as always. Any suggestions you have as well for future topics, please do let us know and we will be looking to plan those in. Finally, from me before we get underway, um, we've been running these webinars every week. Um, the aim is to support our clients and our fellow industry practitioners through these difficult times. We're very conscious that some people aren't currently in work. So we're very happy to offer our support both through these webinars, but also in the form of a free CV and profile review service. So if you're currently job hunting for a new role um, and you're out of work, please do email your profile or CV to team at pmi.co.uk. We'd be delighted to review it and give you some feedback and any opportunities to enhance it. Thank you all for your continued support. And now I'd like to hand over to Sean. Thank you very much, Suze. So welcome everybody. I'd like to add my welcomes to, uh, to Suze and, the, um, and obviously the, as my first event, I'll try and keep the amount of uh, newbie errors down as far as I possibly can. So uh, let's crack on. We've got lots and lots of good stuff to cover today. Um, and obviously I want to hold some time for questions as well. So here it is in terms of our scope today for this presentation. Well, we're talking about what makes a good green belt uh, project. So we want to look at three main things today, how to select the appropriate task. In other words, the scope of the project and then looking at the team and leadership aspects of a good green belt project and then make sure we've got the right benefits coming from having the right purpose. So those three things are what we're going to cover and we'll move on straight away into our very, very first poll. I do apologize for the amount of words on here, but what I will say is this, in my experience, one of these seven things is very, very common. So I'll just shut up for a few seconds and let you read them. Just let us know in your experience, which of these is most likely to happen? for you in your place of work or where you have worked? So I have uh, launched that poll for everybody. So if you're uh, on the webinar with us, then please do start casting your votes once you've had a chance to read through all of those questions. Um, if you're joining us on LinkedIn or Facebook, then please do put your answers in the chat. Sean, out of interest, and just so that people can start to get to know you, I wonder if you could just share with us all um, what's the most interesting Greenbelt project you've ever been involved with? Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I was first trained by, by PMI in 2005, a very, very exciting time. And uh, I think perhaps one of the scariest Greenbelt projects I ever had was the very first one I ran because I was just out on my own. I'd just come off my Greenbelt project, uh, Greenbelt training, and I really was just had all these tools and it was all very exciting, but I didn't really have that much of a clue. Um, and so this was with a training organization. We, we, we closed down the entire administration of the, of the team uh, for a whole, whole week. Uh, and we just blasted a significant and urgent problem. 
And uh, halfway through the week, we got absolutely stuck. We just did not know what we we're doing because I ran out of method. I'd, I'd been following the process, but I, I got lost. And then I just went back and we took some time out and stepped back from it. And, uh, and, and, and we got back on track again. And literally within one week, we had managed to, I mean, obviously there's been quite a lot of preparation work leading up to it, but, but within one week of solution design, we had a process that was running literally 40% more efficiently. Brilliant. And that was my very first project. And that gave me so much confidence because even though I literally really didn't know what I was doing, I had the method and the process that to follow. And, and then I've just let my experience build since then. So yeah, that was a very exciting moment to get started in my <laughs> yes. Six Sigma career. It could have all gone wrong three days in. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Okay. I've heard that PMI, they're, they're a good company to- uh, Well, to uh, yeah, I, I paid for out my own pocket. So it was, a, it was a big investment, definitely at the time for myself. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to close the polling. So if you just want to cast your final votes, and then I'm gonna share those on the screen so everyone can see. So, Sean, yeah. out of so, interest, was that what you were expecting well, it, to see? It's, it's very much what I was expecting. So we, we talk about you know, using green belt and predicting our results. So, Suze, you know when I were talking this morning, I, I predicted, didn't I, that option two and three would be the most popular. But mm. uh, what I wasn't brave enough to say is exactly which one of them. And it turns out option three is. So projects start with a bang. We've got some great ideas. And then they seem to go nowhere. And this, this is, I, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't expecting uh, to see very many number ones. What I'm pleased to see is there are some number yes. ones on there. That is fantastic news. Uh, absolutely brilliant to see. So the, the crucial thing, and what I've, when I was thinking about what to talk about today, it's this sustaining and seeing things through. Because if we, if, if we just jump onto the next slide, if you don't mind me just jumping I'll, onto yeah, the next I'll slide. I'll stop sharing those results and we can Thank come back you. to them later. Um, if you need yeah. To. Ultimately, what makes a good green belt project is one that gets you a good result. I know that sounds tautological. It sounds very straightforward an idea, but but it it is ultimately it's the result we want, which may or may not be the result we were necessarily expecting. Because when we start, we don't necessarily know what the answer is. But what I want to do today is focus a little bit on something here, which is the process of achieving a successful green belt project, and. Um, for those of you who've studied Deming, and if you haven't, please do, uh, a quote that's, that we often use is, your processes are perfectly designed to give you the results you are currently getting, W. Edwards Deming. And here's the thing, so a project, it's maybe a one-off process, but it is still a process. And so all of the logic and skills that we can apply to what's a good process can apply to a green belt project as well. So this is what we want to focus on today. But before we go into any further, um, I just want to share with you a couple of key success factors building from that. So number one is this, it is a project. So a lot of the time that we get, the reason we get results like we get in that, in that, in that poll, and giving me exactly what I was expecting, is that failure to really cons consolidate and sustain, is it's because we don't necessarily treat it like a project, we treat it like a problem that we need to find an answer to. And it's more than that. And there's also a lot of finishing to be done. If any of you bought a new home, I haven't, but I, I often hear from people who bought brand new homes, there's this snagging list that can take some time to get through, even after you've moved into the house. And that's the same thing is true with it as any other project. So here's the key thing here. Standard project management principles and processes apply. So think about it for yourself. As a green belt, um, do you... Um, sorry. I'm just, uh, just looking on the screen, it's not uh, sharing that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I've got a question that's come up, which may or may not be sharing, which is, do your green belts and project sponsors have project management knowledge and skills? Because if, if not, then it's something you might want to think about developing in order to see through that sustainable solution and treat it like a project. And just to reassure you, Sean, everything is absolutely showing perfectly on our Fantastic. screens. Fantastic. Thank you. That's brilliant. Super to hear. Okay, and the second key success factor I want to share with you, and, and basically the reason I'm sharing with these right up front is because if these two things aren't in place, your odds of a good Greenbelt project are pretty slim right from the start. Um, and this one here is the fact that every Greenbelt project, you're trying to achieve some significant step change, like my example of 40% uh, uh, more efficient process, but within, within one week of, of, of when we got to the final installation of our design phase. 
So, so the thing is here is part of a bigger system. That training admin process was part of a training company. That training company was part of a larger organization, that larger organization, and so on. So the crucial thing here is that we need to make sure we've got the time and resources to do it right, not just do it. And we need our sponsor here. Our, our key, the key role here is that leadership and support. And their sponsor's role is not just leadership and support to the team, but also to every stakeholder that's impacted by the project. And therefore, what we're talking about here is, it's, is it is a project and it also is a leadership task. And so standard leadership principles and processes apply. So the question that I'm asking now is, are your project sponsors able to provide this leadership support? And if the answer is no, then it might be worth either descoping the project or looking to see if you can mitigate that through some other route. Um, or, and ideally, obviously, start by talking to your sponsor about whatever uh, support you need from them to do that. And we'll talk some more about both of these things as we go through. But really, if you want your Greenbelt project to succeed, treat it as a project and make sure it's got that right whole system leadership in place so that you can crack on with coming up with the best results. Okay, so let's have a look at your experience now. Um, the second poll, and the, we've only got two polls today, this is the second one. So you may be a green belt, maybe you have a group of green belts who work for you, maybe you're interested in becoming a green belt and, and even haven't yet trained. It doesn't matter to me too much which one of those situations it is. But in this poll, what I'd like to do is look at which one or two, you can select more than one, which one or two of these would you say that you or your team are currently strongest in? So which of these skill sets are you strongest in? So that polling's launched. Thank you for those Thank people that are starting to contribute to it. We often get asked by people who are thinking of going on a green belt, you know, um, uh, do they need to have project management skills as a background, Sean? I don't know if you find people asking you the same question. Absolutely. And every skill set we can get better at. So if you've already got those skills, that's fantastic. You can absolutely apply them. And that's really good. But if you don't have them, one of the things about the Greenbelt project, um, sorry, the Greenbelt training process, is it takes you through a systematic set of, of, of gates and stages and process and activities, which lend themselves naturally to being properly managed as long as you choose to follow them. So even if you don't have that project management experience, coming out of the Greenbelt, you will, be, you will already be in a position to manage your project um, uh, really really very successfully but that said there's plenty more you can always learn on any of these skill sets and and you should you should seek to do so okay super and i'm going to just end that polling and share those results so everyone can see oh, these yeah. results and also i've got some input as well on mm -hmm. uh, our other channels uh, people are saying one and four uh, people are often seeing, um, often number five um, uh, they are seeing as well. So um, okay. thank you for your input on LinkedIn and Facebook. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Well, this is, I mean, certainly the, the poll in front of me, uh, which picks up on the number four from LinkedIn and Facebook as well, improving value to the customer. And to, I, to be quite honest with you, that, that actually fills me with joy because that's <laughs> what this is all about. Ultimately, all the rest is is the, is the trappings about how do we do that and and I'm, I'm really really delighted to see that um, but certainly the poll in front of me and um, the lowest scoring 10% was the effective handover so mm. we will we've got a session specially built into towards the end of this webinar uh, where we will remind people of some of the key handover activities that need to be done but and one thing also, I, sorry, sorry, ahead, yeah. sorry mm. all I was just going to say is also um, an interesting observation in, in uh, the chat. Um, one of our uh, delegates here uh, has said that, it, that in their experience, that if a Greenbelt project does not address a strategic initiative, yeah. it will not get a lot of support from stakeholders. That is think. absolutely true. That, yeah. is, uh, that is absolutely true. One of the, 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 again, that's a really interesting conversation and, and the definition of strategic is something that I, I find does need to be a little bit fluid. It's not just about the big stuff. Mm. It, 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 it's, it's about the important stuff. 
and they're not always the same thing um and and there's lots we could talk about on that yes. maybe that's okay. an interesting what's the difference between strategic important and strategic big anyway so moving <laughs> up there's another thing i want to say here it was a close contender for second place on the poll in front of me which is about working through the team and sponsor to achieve change and again that's exactly what i'd like to see in second place and that's recognizing this is a team that's a whole team thing this is not about the hero change agent the, the hero innovator this is this is about the working together and and if people have got strengths in those areas then that's phenomenal to see and, and, okay. and that's absolutely great stuff thank super you. thank you everybody that's brilliant okay so let's crack on into the core content then so we, we, we've got a number of things to cover the first one and this is especially for the people who are brand new out of their green belt training or maybe about to start a green belt training and they want to make sure they've got something appropriate to bring into the training which by the way is always a good thing to do um because it means the training has context while you're doing it um but yeah so i'm just going to cover two particular aspects here um the first one is something we call the three m's so when we're trying to select what's an appropriate project to do, then make it meaningful. So what do we mean by meaningful? Well, <laughs> thank you to the contributor. Um, you absolutely read the slides in advance. It needs to be linked in some way to the, to the organization's objectives. In other words, it needs to have strategic value um, because otherwise it's usually not going to get that support, just like our contributor said. And the objectives could be about where the business is trying to go to by strategic change, or it might just be limited to just doing what we're here to do better. And it doesn't matter which one of those it is, it can be either. The team needs crucial to it, so it needs to be something that they actually want to see solved as well. And obviously there's no point trying to solve a problem if there isn't one there. So make sure it's a real problem first. Sometimes, and that sounds stupid, but maybe sometimes we think something's a problem, but when we look at it, it takes us somewhere else. So in other words, the presenting problem may not be the most meaningful thing to go after. The next one is where I'm going to be the most woolly, the manageable piece, because it depends on who you are, it depends on your skills, it depends on your level of authority, and so on. But at the end of the day, don't set out to take on more than you can manage. So we've got a number of hints on this. Don't involve too many cross-functional areas. Keep the team relatively small. Make sure that the team have got the, their relief for enough time. The process itself that you're looking to change is not undergoing a major change. So maybe there's a, ma uh, a significant IT change or, or a factory move or a warehouse re remove or something like that is going to happen soon. So don't, don't obviously, it's not the best time to optimize at that point. And of course, we can set a reasonable time scale. Now, all of those are very woolly dimensions. So let me just be a little bit clearer. If, it's an, if I'm an inexperienced green belt, I would say do not involve more than two functional areas as a start place. So yourself and maybe up or downstream internally one space. So a direct supplier, a direct customer. By a small team, it's crucial you involve the process operators, so the people who do the work, but, and maybe some others as well, maybe some experts, but try and keep it to four to six people tops. Time for the project. Anything less than half a day a week, you're not really going to get any traction. And if you're doing something bigger, I usually put about the team aside for two days a week. And then I put a further day a week aside um, of my own time for working with stakeholders and the wider system. Process to undergo major change is self-explanatory, a reasonable time scale. Um, the shortest project I've ever run was three months. Um, uh, there was a proper Greenbelt project, that is. Um, and I have run over, over 12 months. But as a general rule of thumb, three to six months is about right. If you don't think you can get it fixed within that period of time, then it's probably not manageable. And finally, measurable. And, and curiously, I think this one's the, 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 the killer because sometimes we see projects starting where there is access to no data and, and they can't get data. And then it simply doesn't work as a Greenbelt project. You need to do something else. Um, it may be an innovation project. You need to maybe use some lean startup or something like that. Um, but if you can't get the data, you can't use the Greenbelt process very easily, um, if at all. Um, and so you may be going to shift more towards other methods um, instead. So meaningful, manageable, measurable. That's my first hint to you. Sure. Now, so good. Go ahead, Susan. 
Um, we've got a question from Paul, which fits in with that third box that we were just looking yeah. at, at. And his question is, so with customer feedback being so notoriously poor in most yeah. industries, what thoughts do you have on what measures are used to give clean data to show customer value has improved? Ah, brilliant. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So one of the earliest things I do in every single green braille project, um, and it may not be the very first thing I do, I might need to do some process stabilization first, and that's something we would recommend. Um, and, and, and just sort of streamlining it and sorting out some of the obvious things that were just causing trouble. That just, that just builds goodwill. But as soon as I've got the team built and we've got an understanding of, of what is hurting us, we'll go and do a voice of the customer exercise. And um, I personally prefer to train up my team members and get all of them to interview customers and get them to uh, listen, really listen to the words the customers use. And um, because uh, yeah, absolutely right, I think it was Paul who said the name there. It's a mm. absolutely, absolutely appalling these standard tools we've got. Now there are with modern technology, we're getting better and better. Um, but I would not particularly rely on some of the standard measures or customer surveys. What I want to do is listen to the customer. In fact, I even go further. If I'm in any doubt about what defines value from the customer's point of view, in measurable terms, I will say, show me. And if that means me visiting or getting a video link into, show me how you use our service, show me how you use our product. And that way I can understand their definition of value, even if they can't articulate it for themselves. All right, thank you. And thank you, Paul, for your question. Yeah, great, brilliant question, love it. Okay, so a very quick checklist for you. Um, it'll in the side pack for you to come back to, but here's a quick check for you. To, and we've got it for how to identify your first Greenbelt project. But I think a lot of these generalize to any Greenbelt project. First of all, can we deliver a quantifiable benefit? That may be in money terms, but it may be in satisfaction terms. It may be in, in health and safety terms and anything at all, but we need that measure. There's currently no known solution. That's an interesting one. Too often what happens is people say, well, we know what we've got to do. We just need to do it. Well, if that's genuinely the case, we'll just do it. And then obviously be ready to do the Greenbelt project if it turns out they didn't know the answer after all, which is sadly often the case. But specifically and very linked to number two is we don't know what the solution is and we're not even clear what the root cause is. So absolutely, we're now building towards a good green belt project. Maybe the problem is complex. So may, when we talk about the root cause, what if we think there's going to be multiple root causes? And very often in processes, particularly once those processes have been initially streamlined through some 5S or some, some works, um, so some other uh, I can't think of it on the top of my head for the moment, but then we get the idea. Um, but the, we've done some other work to tidy it up and it's still complex, it's still not working right. Then there's common cause variation we need to go after and that, that's important to fix then. You can identify the processes that need to be improved. So this is kind of the opposite way around. If we don't know where to improve, how can we improve it? And, and so sometimes we have to do further investigation before we can even find the correct process. And today's complex global companies, that can often be an issue. So fix a problem without a process attached to, not so good. The processes are repeatable. So projects are very difficult to run a greenbelt project uh, process improvement on because they're long and they run in units of one. Something that runs in units of 5,000 a day, very, very straightforward. But as long as your general rule of thumb, as long as the process runs you know, 10 to 20 times a week, then it, it, it's normally quite straightforward to run a Greenbelt project on it. Um, the effect can be defined. So in other words, we can actually work out whether or not the project has made a difference. This one's an interesting one, little or no capital investment required. I would, I, 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 that's definitely true for your first Greenbelt project because it adds a lot of complexity. But what I would say is sometimes the result of the Greenbelt project is you've improved something to a certain degree, but you've also identified now a really strong and clear business case for further investment. And therefore, I'd actually always recommend run the Greenbelt project before significant investment, because then you can avoid the investment potentially. And if not, you've got a clearer view of where the investment should be. So whether it's an IT changeover or a machine upgrade or whatever it might be, I would always run the Greenbelt project prior to the capital investment. 
And then of course, finally, uh, one I've already covered, we can get it done in three to six months. Yeah. So that's a gen general hint for you and hopefully you'll find that useful. Okay, now I'm checking the time. I promised Suze that I'm gonna run over heavily. Um, looks like I'm living up to my promises. <laughs> no, we're doing well. Okay, so we want to move on to a new topic now, which is the team and the team environment. And I've got four different ideas to share with you. Facing up, facing out is the first one. So what do I mean? So facing up, facing out. So I'm thinking, imagine you are the green belt now. Many of you will be, but some of you may not be. So I just want you to put yourself in the position of the green belt. And I want the, to think about the concept, the green belt needs to face upwards towards the sponsor with these two critical questions. What are we, the project team, including the sponsor, doing for and to the organization? And the reason for that is because when we're working on the Greenbelt project, we might be achieving some step change. That could have consequences that are reaching well beyond the project scope and they're often unknowable in advance. So we need to have this regular, maybe even weekly conversation with the sponsor. What are we doing for, what are we doing to the organization? And then asking of the sponsor, what support's needed to make this actually happen? And so keeping the sponsor live as a key member of the outward facing team, the facing out. And therefore the sponsor needs to be facing out to the wider business saying, have I got the protection around this team safe? And by safe, I mean, they've got their time released and they're supported and, and they're not getting too much grief and criticism from their peers and so forth. And also spotting, are there any unintended consequences or benefits? Now, unintended consequences is where there's a system change that has the negative result and an unintended benefit is where maybe we do some changes here, but actually we un without realizing it, we fixed a problem somewhere else in the business. And we need to capture that and make sure that those things are linked back together so the project can understand its whole system benefit. And of course, the sponsor can then, can then create the recognition, the value for that improvement as part of the project improvement. And that's quite a difficult thing to do. So the sponsor needs to be constantly facing out on behalf of the project and looking after it. Okay, so that's facing up, facing out. Then the green belt needs to be facing with and facing through the team. And the reason I'm saying this is because the project team is often the primary constraint on the quality of any solution. If you've got a highly motivated and creative team, then they might be thinking very, very innovatively about what could be done and how things could be fixed. But if they're all in meh space the whole time, then all they're gonna do is think about the first idea and that'll be the only idea. So you need to, as the green belt, face with the team, how are we going to solve this problem and keep the energy level up and that motivation up. And from the poll, some of you are saying that this is already a strength for you. So you recognize hopefully what I'm saying here. And then the question is, how will we embed this back into the daily work? The project itself is this little microcosm that we've hidden away for a short period of time um, while, we, while we change the world. And, and it needs to go back into the daily work. And we need to think about that with the team. How will we embed this back in? Something that we actually will be proud of, of taking back into the workplace. And then through the team members, the green belt needs to be asking the question, out there in the real world, what's going on? What's really going on? What are people actually saying? What will be an acceptable solution? Not necessarily the one that's most statistically valid, although that's obviously beautiful if you can have it, but what will be accepted by the business? What's an acceptable solution that people will want to work? And ultimately, the team members are asking the question, how do I stay friends with my colleagues throughout this project? Because as they get more and more into this, they might be, almost seen as alien by their peers and, and you have to help them and look and, and face through them and support that. And one of the tricks I use a lot is I every time people are getting a bit of grief, which normally happens after a while, I, I, I say, well, bring them into the team. You know, let's get them involved in some trials. You know, we need some fresh blood and fresh ideas anyway. So as, P, as that stage happens, I try and help them to help their teammates and bring them in. So facing up, and now facing with and through. Okay, two tools that will really help you with this. If you're not familiar what these tools are, I haven't got time to cover them in detail today, but they are important tools. And the first one is the charter itself. 
if you can properly charter the pro the team in the first place, if you properly charter the project in the first place, then what you're saying is there is a contract between the team and the business to get this thing done properly. So doing that properly, now you might use a project charter template, you may use A3 methodologies, there's lots of different ways you can do this. Or kids as well, you know, prints do, lots to do, but it, make sure you do it and make sure the tip project is set up with the team, to solve a real problem, properly resourced. And the second one is a tool called the SIPOC. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was first trained in this, I didn't get it. In fact, it took me about five years to get it because I hadn't appreciated the importance of getting onto a single page, the end-to-end -end perspective. Who are the suppliers? What are they inputting? To which process to give what outputs for which customers? SIPOC, S-I-P-O-C. And this template and this tool is a living document that you can use to make sure you've got the right focus, the right scope, the right understanding of what the current state is. And if the project moves you somewhere else, it gives you a very quick and clear idea about where to move. And then obviously you can update it accordingly. So these two tools are about getting the team off to the right starting point. And then when you're into the project, it's all about, to my mind, it's the values. There's millions of tools out there now, huge numbers of tools. And by all means, learn as many as you need. But for me, what underpins it all is the values. And I just captured a few of them here. So the first one for me is caring about the customer first. If you always keep the customer front and center throughout your project, it's very hard to go off track, however much pressure you're under. If you keep the solution thinking around what's practical and what is sustainable, you're much less likely to come up with something that can never go, quite get around to being implemented. Back to that first poll where you told me that was one of the issues. And then I think this is a subtle point, but it's an important one. A lot of businesses I've worked with over the years have been very good at telling about who our best people are, you know, our top talent. And while I understand the, the value of that, and it's, in, and it's an attractive thing, and it sits very nicely with certain cultures, certain, certain uh, global cultures, actually, the people who can outwork the unstable process, they're the sellotape that's holding what's broken together. That's not what you want. What you want, the true heroes, in my opinion, are the ones who follow the process every time, and it's successful, and they're happy to keep doing that. <laughs> because they're the people who will give you consistent results time and time again. Now, obviously, you have to get your processes to a point where the processes are stable. That's the agreement. But recognize those heroes, the ones who are happy to work in the same way for three years, time and time again, without ever letting the system down. They're phenomenal people. For the previous set of heroes, train them up as your green and black belts and get them fixing stuff, because they're going to get bored quite quickly. Okay. So... Quick time check, see where we are. Fantastic. So we want to deliver projects that have purpose. We get our benefits by focusing on purpose. I hope to persuade you of this. This is a really can be quite a contentious topic. Um, and I've had many, many arguments with my clients over the years um, about this particular topic. And when I mean argument, what I actually mean is long careful conversations that everybody feels passionate about <laughs> so we don't argue we we work through until we've got a shared understanding of the definition of benefit and i want to share some things with you um, from those conversations we've had over the years so first thing i want to show is, is the idea of the four wins um a few years ago it was only three the fourth one has been added on because of the state we've put the world in so number one, we want to make sure that every Greenbelt project we run results in the work being better for the customer. Now, if it's just a small starter Greenbelt project, the definition of the customer may be the next stage in the process, the internal customer. And that, while that runs the risk of just local optimization and, and various other challenges, it's still better for the next person in line with the process. And therefore, it's still better for the customer. As you grow your confidence and you're focusing on the voice of the external customer being the driver for the project, then better for the customer means, back to Paul's question, the def we've done the voice of the customer, we've defined in operational terms what it is that they value, um, we work with them to do that, we've set up the measures, and now we're measuring have we got things closer to their definition of perfect 
or not? Are we closer to everything being right or not? Are we closer to zero scrap or not? And that's what we mean by better for the customer. And it's better for the people. At the end of the day, if people are not happier and more and their well-being and they're feeling more confident and more capable as a result of the new design, then you've missed on this second point. And that will ultimately lead to later failures downstream. It won't sustain. Obviously, the result needs to be better for the business. But on my next slide, I'll talk through why to still keep these other two up front. And then the business, it's better for the business as a result of those two things. And then better for the environment is now talking about the global space that, that, that all of our businesses are now in. So have we designed a way of running this process that uses less energy, uses less space, uses less raw materials, um, and so on, so forth. And, 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 and I also mean from a health and safety point of view as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a healthier place to be. So, so all four of those wins should be on your checklist, not just number three. And here's where I'll explain why. So why to focus on value versus focus on cost? And this is the difficult conversation I have with many of my customers. Not all, some of them are already in this space, but some of them are not. Some of them, they want to see the cash savings in advance of the project. And, and that just messes everything up. And let me explain why. Okay, so I'm gonna argue first for focus on value to the customer. And I've got this process that I've seen happen time and time again when you follow it this way. We start with our voice to the customer. We understand what they value, just like um, we've already discussed. And from that, we identify the core purpose of that process or end-to-end -end value stream, depending on the size of the project we're working on. We can then, without any distraction whatsoever, seek to eliminate or reduce anything and everything that does not add value. Which allows us, therefore, obviously, to maximize the value creation without the additional capacity or resource required, because we, we're reducing the amount of capacity and resource required because we've removed the things that are not adding value. If we no longer have to pay for the cost of poor quality, it's highly likely, and in my experience, it's always the case, but I can't promise it will always be the case, but it's highly likely if we're no longer paying for the cost of poor quality, our revenues could go up because we've got more satisfied customers or you know, our viral networking get, ha happens, our viral marketing happens better because people trust us more and so on and so forth. So our revenues might go up and our margins are likely to go up because we no longer have to pay for the cost of, of, of failure in the process. So that's pretty good. And it just follows that three-step process. Define the value, eliminate or reduce that which does not add value, and then we no longer have, we've removed the cost of poor quality, and so our margins and or revenues have probably gone up. Here's what happens when you do it the other way around. The business case approach, as, as it's often called. You know, how much money is this going to save the business? And that's set on some kind of upfront goal. Well, what happens is this, is we often end up being set arbitrary cost reduction targets. And the reason I say arbitrary is because they're not linked to what the customer values. The customer is not saying, I need you to reduce your cost by 15% in the next quarter. That's not what customers say to us on the whole. And what happens here is now a psychological process. And I want to focus on the psychology because theoretically, A and B should be the same thing. But they're not, and it's not, they're not because of the psychology of, our, of, of how our human brains work. Because if we set a target, our brain focuses on that target. And if the target is an arbitrary cost reduction target, what we will then do is say, right, where are the biggest cost areas, because that's where it's going to be easiest to achieve the target. So we then go and do a process redesign to remove cost from the bigger cost areas, but we've not done the work required to remove the causes of cost usually yeah there may be exceptions to this as always nothing's ever absolute but apart from that statement i guess um but we have not usually taken the time to remove the causes of cost so we get a temporary lift in our numbers hey we've had the best quarter on record fantastic but what we've actually done is built in instability to our processes and our system because we've not we've taken out capacity but we've not taken out the demand on that capacity 
So what happens then is our instability, it will come through in the form of more issues coming up and more resources being required. So a classic one I've seen time and time again over the last 20 years is we've outsourced to save money, we've put the service or the, or the manufacturing in a place that we've got less control over, over at an arm's length distance, and then the quality has fallen, and then we've had to build in additional costs to do rework or management of the outsourced process. Total cost gone up or at best stayed the same. And therefore, we have this bizarre situation that we set ourselves the goal of reducing our costs, but in fact, our revenues might fall because we've actually, our quality has fallen, and our margins could fall because we've got to pay for the additional cost of poor quality over what we originally had. And the reason I see this process happen time and time again, and why, why the system doesn't learn why this doesn't work, is because of this delay here. There is a delay that separates the cost reduction exercise from the impact on the system. Now, it may only be a day or two, but usually it's two, three, four months and before the, the, the impact comes through. And as a result of that, the, the problem is never connected back to the original solution. And that delay is the crucial thing. So please be aware that if, you've, if you're going down focused on cost, you can't help it, your brain will fall into, the, into these patterns and you run a significant risk. So if you really, really do want improved revenue and margins, please take our advice and focus on customer value first and work through eliminating the, the costs of poor quality, the costs of failure, and then you can eliminate things sustainably. Okay. So some of this is going to be very straightforward for you and some of it in your project is going to be difficult. So I've just got a couple of words of encouragement for you. First of all, the process works. If you follow the Greenbelt process properly, fully, it always works. <laughs> there is always a solution. You can always find a better way of doing the work than, you, than, than is available now. I have, I've, there's some, several times where I've lost the faith for maybe a day or two, but you, you just, just never quit and you will find a better way. And then remember that every time you make an improvement, my definition, remember the four wins, and you, you know, achieving those four things, you've achieved an impro something important there. So please do take the time to celebrate it. Make it so being on a project team is something that's not just additional work, it's something you can be really proud of, and it's something that you feel like it was worth doing when you get to the end of it. And it's really, really important to do that, um, celebrating of success. So. Sean, just while you're here, mm. um, they've there, been asked a question, and mm. I just felt on under the topic of don't quit, there's a yeah. big difference between don't quit, don't give up, and quit because actually something has changed and the question mm. was around you know can a greenbelt project be cancelled at some point and I, I don't know about yourself but in my experience that does happen with clients yeah. and it often happens for really good reasons and that could be we've changed our plan you know we've yeah. changed where we're going so yeah. stop that greenbelt do something different instead that yeah. is a priority for us now so Br brilliant question yeah Thank I think you, it's a great Suze. question, but I think also, you know, it is a yes under circumstances, but back to Sean's point, don't don't cancel the green belt because you've run out of energy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Even, even though there's been several times where I've really wanted to, <laughs> being honest with you here. Right. <laughs> Thank fact, you. I mean, I've, been to, I've been to more than one client saying, can I just stop? This is just too hard. And they said, no, <laughs> carry on, Sean, stop whinging. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even waste my time with the question anymore. No, no, seriously, there is always a better way. But I'm just going to refer you back to two things we've covered here. If at any point the three M's rule gets broken, so if it stops being meaningful, manageable, or measurable, then it actually becomes a very difficult thing to do. Particularly that first one. If you can't, if it ceases to have meaning because the world around you has changed, then obviously stop it. But if it becomes unmanageable, then you may need to maybe stop it in its current form and rescope it. And that does happen quite often. You know what? We've got 12 different root causes or 13 in one case. You know what? We're just going to focus on the top five. And back to Pareto. What is the most important things we can do with this project team time so it doesn't become overwhelming? You know what? It, realistically, we need six different work streams to fix all of these different root causes. Well, the, 
these two work streams make the most sense and they can be implemented without necessarily impacting on the other things at this point in time. So let's just go and get those two things done. So rescoping absolutely makes sense. Remember, you're going into a problem where you don't know how complex it is in advance. The green belt project could easily run into a black belt project unexpectedly, and maybe you need to reskill or re re rescope the team and so forth. But there is always a better way, eat within whatever scope you're working to. And the other thing I was going to say, so along with the three M's on that one, um, is the, uh, actually she's going to clean out my head right now. Um, uh, yeah, the other thing that can stop a project is classic standard project management stuff. And this is why I say treat it like a project. If when you set out the, 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 the original assumptions about why it needed to be fixed and what the benefits would be, and actually it turns out, and I, see, I can think of a black belt project off the top of my head, where the end result was, you know what, there's actually nothing to be fixed, we just need to live with this problem. Yeah, there was no, the, you know, there was no point carrying forward. So if on the basis of it, it no longer making sense as a project, then, uh, then yeah, it's obviously a good idea to stop it. Super, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Great question. So now on to lasting results. And uh, I'm just going to finish up with this because um, people, uh, it's often the case where this is perhaps done the least well. And the poll at the beginning suggests that we're, we're, I'm not alone in this opinion. <laughs> So I'm just going to just remind people of, now these things apply to any project really, um, but they've taken from our standard um, continuous improvement cycle, our, our, um, our improvement cycle that we use at PMI. So we, everything we do is driven by Plan, Do, Study, Act. For people who are more familiar with DMAIC, then you can see where things did DMAIC, and then the PMI stages that we use. And I just want to take you through the last three, just as a reminder. Once we've got our solution and we've tested it in our test environments, we know it's going to be better than what we had before. It's time to test it in the target environment. And there's four key elements to that. And target environment obviously is back in the real world. Who are we implementing this with? And what are their needs? What's their position? If we've been doing what we discussed earlier or what I was saying earlier, um, properly, then they're already familiar with the test. They've even been involved with them. The key stakeholders are already on side because our sponsor has been doing their bit. And so we understand the implementation community should already be in a good, we should be in a good position with this right now. But it's very different when we turn the tap and say, you know what, now we're actually doing this for real. And there'll be a moment of panic and jitter and nervousness very often, depending on the maturity of your organization. So make sure you understand what their confidence level is and, and, and build your, your pace of change accordingly and, and the level of support. Understand the competencies required. And um, it's really important that people feel that they can be successful. I know my old process is bad, but at least I know it and I know how to succeed within it. But your new process is new to me. I feel like I'm a new starter again. I don't like that feeling. Help me out. It's not just about training. It's about holding my hand for a period as well. Develop the communication plan. Every project I run on, you know what we should have done more of? More communicating. <laughs> it's always the case, right? This is the wrong time to have the final communication plan. Um, it, it is, we should have been communicating all along. What we need to do at this point is have the detailed communication plan about exactly when things are going live, how we're doing it, which shifts are going to be starting with it, what the backup plan is, if it all goes wrong, and so on. Really, really top quality communication. And of course, the plan, the implementation plan that we're ready to follow. Once we've done this, we now need to hand the new design over to the existing process managers. Now, if you've already started moving from a vertical functional organization to more of a horizontal value stream organization, you will already have process owners and process management in place. But many businesses don't have that yet. So it's very important, it's very clear to people who is responsible at a supervisory and operational management level for taking ownership of the new designed process. Because the green belt cannot possibly own it going forward on behalf of the whole business. And when we're handing this over, we need to also hand over what's the monitoring process that the team will continue to do um, until eventually the process management take ownership of, the, of it fully. And what are the reaction plans? 
and that links to the bottom point there, identifying the risks and countermeasures. We need to make sure we've deployed the standard improvements that are already well documented, well trained out, and that people are following them. And we need, I to say, to back that up the documentation of the new best known way that you've created and make sure that people are comfortable with that and are able to feed back on it. We've now handed over the project to operations. So now the sponsor, the operations, the process owners, and the Greenbelt team can meet one last or type two or lot, one or twice last times on the project to make sure that we've captured the learning, the conclusions, what are we going to share out? What would we do differently? What are we going to do next? And all of those kind of things so that you build momentum. Um, and yes, by all means, take some time out, celebrate, get all the team down the pub or, or, or into a nice meal out or just even a walk along the beach or something or in a picnic. It doesn't matter what you, whatever the team chooses to do, but please make sure you do it. And, and then have something to take a break, a week, two weeks, a month maybe tops, and then right, what's the next thing to get done? And usually a Greenbelt project will tell you what the next thing to do is because there's always going to be something that you weren't able to implement and, and it's clear that you should still implement. So, drawing to a close, in summary, please remember this. It's a great checklist, really useful checklist. Make it your own. Put your own standards around it, depending on your own experience and company-wise. Make it, make it whatever you need to make it but please do use this just to protect yourself. Anything that's smaller, maybe a Kaizen type event or even just daily continuous improvement, anything that you know you're gonna need high, high levels of complex statistics, probably more like a black belt project, but green belt project in my experience is the majority of projects and therefore uh, this is the crucial checklist. So there we go. And summary of key points. Treat the project as a project. Resource it properly, manage it accordingly. Three M's within the capability of the green belt. That will grow over time with success. Set the team up to succeed and keep the motive of the project charter, the CIPOC, et cetera. Get, keep them motivated along the way. Um, I try and sort of do a, a, an optional, for example, weekly trip out just for a coffee or an ice cream or something like that. It all helps just keep things going, build the team. And then obviously the effective support from the sponsor, um, both within the team and the wider business. Stay focused on the core purpose of the process. Never lose sight of who the customer is and what the definition of value is. And that way you can make sure that your new designs, your activities, your processes, your workspaces at digital and physical can be optimized around delivering of that value. And remember the closeout activities so that you finish strong, not drifting off into infinity. So with that, I will draw this to a close and pass Thank you back you. to Suze. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much indeed. That was really interesting. And thank you, everyone, for all of your comments and questions. Any other comments or questions, please do get in touch with us. Um, just a quick reminder before we close, we've um, uh, launched our version of uh, our online Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt. Um, it's a great support tool, particularly if you are running a Green Belt project and you want to upskill some of your team members. This might be something for you to consider. So uh, do have a look and get in touch as well if you want to understand a bit more about it. And also we are continuing our, our offer of providing an Apple iPad to equip everybody who joins our public green belt, black belt, or master black belt courses. So if you um, are attending this webinar to understand a little bit more about green belt, then do um, uh, have a look at our website and, and get in touch again. Uh, I'm very happy to chat with you about what's, what's involved in our green belt course. Uh, finally, do look out for our Voice the Customer survey. Um, you're going to receive that from us shortly. We really, really appreciate your feedback. We do review them every week um, and we look for your, uh, your feedback that tells us what we can improve and we also look at your suggestions for future topics. So I shall be reading those with interest next week. Um, and that brings us to the end of today's webinar. So on behalf of PMI, of Sean, and thank you for your first webinar, Sean, much appreciated. 
um, and also to um, um, everyone here and, um, and from me, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and I wish you a very safe and a very relaxing weekend. Thank you.